Hello class, welcome to this video on lesson three of calculus series. So uh, we have another calculus one topic, so uh, we're going to continue our discussion on limits. So we're going to find limits analytically. All right, so let's look at um, uh, limits and just kind of recall a couple of things. So uh, remember that in the previous lesson, we when we discussed limits, we uh, said that the limit of f of x as x approaches c may exist regardless of whether the value of f of x equals c exists. So the function value at um, c may not exist, but the limit would still exist. So in other words, the limit of f of x as x approaches c is equal to l, so that limit exists and it's equal to a number l, even if the function at c is undefined. There are times, however, in which the limit is actually equal to the value of f um, at x equals c, and this is given as follows. So the limit as f of x as x approaches c is equal to f at c. So um, a quick example of this is you might have a function that um, like this, uh, for example, function that looks kind of like that. Um, and so this, let's say this, this is x equals c over here, right? Well, we can see that f at c is undefined, right? So this is undefined. Um, there's a hole there. However, the limit exists, right? So we could say that the limit of, as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l, some value l, right? Uh, wherever that point is located. All right, so that's what we mean by the limit. The limit could exist, but the function itself uh, at c does not. Um, however, there are some times where it could, uh, it could uh, exist or it could be defined. Uh, for example, if I take the same function here and I have, instead of being a hole there, I have it filled. So I have a point that exists there. In that case, that's what we're talking about here. The limit is actually equal to the function. In this case, we can scratch this out and say, well, no, it's not undefined anymore. It's actually equal to L, and so they're equal to each other. And so in that case, uh, we could say that uh, in order to evaluate this kind of limit, we can use a direct substitution. We can, we can literally plug in C into X and get the F of C, right? So this is known as direct substitution. So for example, um, if, I, if I'm doing the limit of x squared plus, five, plus 2 as x approaches 5, well then I could just do a direct substitution and plug 5 into x, right? And I get 5 squared plus 2 is equal to 27. That would be the case that we drew here, you know, where, you, where the function is equal to the limit. So uh, let's take a look at our first uh, theorem for the lesson. So let k and c, let two um, values, k and c, uh, be an element of the real numbers. Okay, so this uh, means uh, an element. Okay, so it belongs to the real numbers, and this is the this means the real numbers, right? So if you're not used to this notation, I want to make sure that you're you're used to it. So let k and c be element of real numbers, or let, let them be real numbers, essentially, okay? Uh, and let n be an element of the positive integers. So this means uh, the z here is the integers. So, and then this plus means positive. So this means the positive integers. So for example, one, two, three, those are positive integers, right? Uh, well, in that case, then we can say our first property is that the limit of a constant k, so k is a real number now, right? The limit of k, where k is a constant, as x approaches c, is equal to k. So in other words, if I have a, if k is equal to a number, so for example, if a k is equal to 4, well then the limit of 4 as x approaches 10, it's 4. If you think about it, that makes sense, right? Because if um, this, if this is, if this function f of x is equal to four, right? Well, that's saying that the graph looks like this. It's a graph where um, it's just a constant value of four, like this. Sorry, that should have crossed through four there. <laughs> But let's say that we have that. Well, then that's just a flat curve, right? Or a flat line, you know, just a straight line going through four. 
Um, so it's four everywhere. And so if I'm looking at X approaching 10, right? Uh, what and and I'm approaching it on the cur on the curve itself, right? Well, then of course the value is going to be uh, four, right? Because it's four everywhere. Uh, so that makes sense. All right, and then for the second um, property of the theorem, um, the limit um, uh, of the function x is as x approaches c is c. So in other words, we're doing a direct substitution and just plug it in C. So here's an example. The limit, is, the limit of X as X approaches 5 is 5. Uh, again, if, if, you, if you call this F of X, right? So then F of X is equal to X. Well, that's just uh, the equation. That's just the um, equation of a line, right? That goes to the origin. So this is the, this is the function um, Y equals to X, where Y is, equal, where y is F of X, right? Um, so if I'm looking for, uh, for example, five, well then if I, if, if um, I put fly five into here, well, that's going to give me the uh, point five on the function, right? If I'm approaching it from the left and from the right. So that makes sense, right? Wherever I'm looking for, that's the same value on the graph. All right. And then the limit um, of X to the N power. Uh, as x approaches c is equal to c to the n power. Again, this is sort of like doing a direct substitution. So if I'm plugging in here, I can I can plug this number into here, and I get negative two to the fifth power, which is negative thirty-two. So these properties allow you to do a direct substitution into x, and that's what, uh, the main key here. And again, from here to here, you can use this property to get this property, because we know that if I do this x to the n power, well that's the same thing as doing this limit here raised to the n power. And if I plug it in, well then I know that this here is c based off of property number two, and so I have c to the n. So you can get property three from property two. All right, so um, here's the next um, theorem, um, some more properties here. Um, so let k, is, let k and c uh, be elements of the real numbers and let n be elements uh, an element of the positive integers and let f and g be functions with the given limits uh, the following limits are the limit is f of f of x as um, so we have here the limit of f of x at, um, as x approaches c is equal to l and the limit of g of x as x approaches c of um, is equal to m. So we have two different limits here to, for two different functions. Uh, and so the first property is that if I have a, a scalar, uh, so if I have, uh, so k is a real number now, right? So k is a scalar, a scalar is a constant. Um, so if I have a constant that multiplies the function, I can pull the constant out. And that gives me the scalar multiple property. If I pull it out, then I know that this here is equal to L. And so I have K times L. All right, so here's an example. So if uh, the limit of F of X as X approaches one is negative two, then if I multiply it by three, a scalar, that's my K, right? I can pull that out. And then I can just do the limit here is just negative two, right? Um, so that's the limit part. And then I can multiply them. All right, so here's the sum and difference properties. If I if I add the two different functions and I evaluate them at the same limit, at uh, at the same point, well then um, I can just basically do the limits individually and then add them um, add them together. Okay, um, pretty straightforward. So if I have, um, for example, the limit of of f of x as x approaches one is negative two, and then the same limit but for g of x is five. Well then, uh, if, I, if I'm adding those functions together, I can separate them, right? I can do this, and then I can do this separately, and then they're both just add them together. All right, the same thing for the product. I can do the product of, um, uh, I can do the limit of a product is equal to the product of the limits. So I can separate out the limits and then um, multiply them together to get um, the total limit here. So here's an example. If I have negative two and five as the limits of two different functions, if I'm taking the limit of the product 
here, then I can split them up. I can split it up into this, which is equal to the negative two. And I can split it up into the g of x portion, which is the five, and multiply them. And same thing for the quotient. I can um, do, this works for quotients as well. I can do the quotient. The, so the, the limit of a quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits. So um, I can separate them up into numerator and denominator and then I'll get those. And this works as long as the denominator is not equal to zero. We cannot have the denominator equal to zero because it's gonna be undefined, right? So this works as long as the limit of the g of x function is not zero. So for example, if I have the same two uh, limits, negative two and five, if I'm doing the limit of this quotient here, that I can do it separately. And so if I do this part here, then that's negative two. And if I do the g of x part, then that's five. So I got negative two fifths. And then, um, so we got, this should be the final property for the theorem, is that if I'm doing um, the limit of a function raised to a power, then that's equal to the, the limit of the function raised to that power. So I can basically do, leave the power to the very end uh, and then raise the limit to that power. Okay, so if I have uh, f of x, the limit, um, this, if I have this first limit, which is equal to negative two, and then I take uh, the same function, I raise it to the third power, well then I can just do the limit first, which is negative two, and then raise it to the power of three. All right, so these properties and those from theorem one, three one allow us to do direct substitution. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna be doing a lot, right? Uh, in this lesson, right? We're gonna be doing a lot of direct substitutions. So for um, example one, we have the following limit we want to use um, the previous two theorems. So we're going to do a direct substitution, right? So we're going to plug in, uh, so before before we start plugging it in, we're going to use those theorems, right, those properties. So we have here a quotient, and uh, so the limit of a quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits. So you can split the quotient into two limits here. Um, and then we know that this, this is a constant, so we can pull that constant out, right? So we can do that. And then this is a product, so we can split it into two separate, um, a product of two different limits, right? And then, um, so then we know that this power here can be raised, right? So it can, we can do it, we can do the limit first and then raise it to the second power. So that's what we're doing the next step. And then we have a sum here, so we can split it into two different limits, this one and this one, right? Same thing here, we have a difference, so we can split it into two limits. That's what we do in the next step. All right, and then we know that, then we can do a direct substitution, plug in negative one um, here into x, right there, and then I get negative one to the second power, and then I'm, I'm doing direct substitutions at this point. I'm plugging this into the function. All right, and then I evaluate it to get negative one. Now, do you have to do all of these? Um, do you have to show all these steps? And, and the answer is not necessarily. Um, you could just do a direct substitution. So we're gonna show you that. So note that for this example, I, I wanted to show you how the, the theorems work in conjunction in order to get a limit. However, we could just do a direct substitution and we don't have to necessarily break it down into the individuals, right? The, the different properties. Um, this is just showing those properties. Um, all right, so uh, we could just plug it in and um, just do a direct substitution into all of these, right? Uh, and then get our limits that way, okay? All right, so this works as long as the function involved is a continuous function. So for example, a polynomial function, a trigonometric function, um, so as long as the function uh, is continuous within its domain, right, then you can, you can do this, um, you know, you could just do a direct substitution. We're going to do it in the next lesson on, continu on continuity, but just to let you know, you know, this works as long as, you know, all polynomial functions are continuous. We're going to look at this in the next property. So the next theorem. So the next theorem, if P is a polynomial function and C is an element of the real numbers, then uh, I can do a limit of that polynomial function as x approaches c, and it's just going to be the polynomial function at c. So in other words, I can do a direct substitution and get 
the limit. That's what we were talking about earlier. Um, and so this, like I said, this works as long as the function is continuous and polynomial functions are always continuous. In fact, they're continuous everywhere. A polynomial function, for example, is like a line or a uh, cubic function or a parabola, right? Anything of the form x to the n or ax to the n plus bx to the n minus one plus cx to the n minus two, so, so on and so forth. We have x raised to a power. And as long as, um, you know, it's not of uh, where n is a is a, whole, a positive number, right? So x to the one power, x to the second power, x to the third power, right? Uh, any combination thereof, any linear combination of that. Uh, so anything that looks like that. Um, so there's a lot of polynomials. So we can use this, take advantage of that property um, in order to uh, take the limit. Uh, so if, all right, so uh, if R is a um, rational function, um, so for example, R of X is equal to P of X over Q of X. So uh, in this case, P and Q are polynomial functions. Um, and C um, is an element. So um, C is a real number such that this means uh, this here means uh, such that. Another way that we could say such that is uh, using this symbol right here. We'll see that in another theorem later. Um, but yeah, so when you see that bar, that's what that means. Um, this is set builder notation. So C is an element of, uh, of a C is a real number such that Q of Q at C is not equal to zero. So in other words, the denominator cannot be zero, which we know that can't happen. So if that's true, then we could say that the limit um, of the uh, rational function r of x um, at x equal, uh, as x approaches c, we could just do a direct substitution and get r of c, and uh, r of c is just the equal to the polynomial functions at c, right? The the two polynomial functions divided uh, that quotient, and again, this works as long as the denominator is not zero. Okay, so again direct substitution you could do a direct substitution for rational functions for polynomial functions as long as for rational functions it's not undefined you can plug it in all right so uh, here's another example so this is a rational function which you can compose you know it's composed of two polynomials one in the top one in the top and one in the bottom right so uh using the the previous theorem of uh, the rational function r of x we can plug it in uh, plug in C in order to get um, the func, you know, the the limit, and in this case, the C is equal to one, right? So we're going to plug in um, this into um, every everywhere we see x, we're going to plug it in, do a direct substitution, and so if we do a direct substitution, we get on a numerator, we get four on the denominator, um, we get. Uh, let me make sure. Let me make sure that's right. Um, okay, so I want to go ahead and make uh, just correct that. I'm not sure why uh, I wrote that. Um, so this should say, let me correct that here. Say one to the third plus one. Sorry. And then this should say, if I plug it in, it's going to be two times one minus one times one plus one. So I'm plugging in x. I'm plugging uh, x is equal to one into the denominator and numerator. So in that case, the numerator is going to be two. One cubed plus one is two. So this should say two. And then for the bottom, it's going to be uh, two minus one times one plus one is two. So it's going to be one times two, which is two. So the denominator is also two. Uh, and two divided by two is one. Okay. So sorry about that. Um, so we that, so now that we corrected that, um, so that means that this works as long as um, the denominator is not zero, which is not because the denominator here is equal to two. Okay, so that the theorem works. All right, so let's look at the next uh, theorem here. So this works. This is a theorem for radical um, functions. So uh, square roots, cube roots, and so on and so forth. So let the radical index n be an element of the positive integers. Then the limit uh, of you know the nth root of x as x approaches c, uh, well, you could do a direct substitution and say that that is equal to the nth root of c. So you could do a direct substitution there. And this is valid for all c uh, when n is odd. 
So if you have an odd number, this is valid for all C, and this is only valid for C is greater than zero when N is even, okay? So we're gonna look at um, examples of this. So um, if you think about it, it makes sense because um, C has to be positive. You can't take the, squ the square root of a negative number, right? So if I had the limit as X approaches um, negative one, right? um of the square of the square root right of x well i can't plug in i can't plug that in to x and get a limit in the real numbers right because i can't take the square root of a negative number and here in this case in the case of the square root the uh, index is two right there's an invisible two there um so if the, if the index is even you can't have this being uh c being a negative number i cannot I, this is going to be square root of negative one and that's going to be a question mark, right? Because you can't take the square root of a negative number and not get something that's in the real numbers. We can get complex numbers, of course, but that's not where we're focused on. We're focused on real numbers. All right, so we won't be able to plug that in um, is basically what it's saying. But you can plug it in if it's a if it's odd, if n is odd. So if I did, if I this if this was a cube root, and then I did and I plugged the negative one, well, the cube root of negative one is negative one, right? Because negative one to the third is negative one. All right, so uh, here's another uh, theorem. Um, so if f and g are functions such that, remember this remember this symbol means such that, so sometimes you'll see me abbreviate like that, such that the two limits, right? So the limit of, uh, of g of x is, as x approaches c is l, and the limit of f of x as x approaches c is f at l, so f of l. Um, then we could say that the limit uh, of f of g of x, so this is a composition, right? So this is the same thing as f circle g or f compose g of x. So we can also write it like that sometimes with a little circle in the middle. That's composition. So basically, if g of x is an f, so f of g of x, and we take that limit, well, then we can say that we can take, we can say that this is equal to f of the limit and then you could do the limit of g of x inside f. And then we know that that limit is L, and so this turns into f of L, okay? So this is what the theorem says. This is the theorem for composition of functions. Uh, so we're gonna use this in, uh, for radicals. So these two theorems work really, really well for radicals. So, um, so for, if I look at the first example, um, this limit of this square root function, I can say that this, is, this square root function is equal to f of this portion right here, right? F of that, where F is just square root of X. And the G of X is that portion that is inside F of X. So the G of X is the X cubed plus X minus five, the polynomial portion, right? So this is that polynomial portion. So basically if I plug this into this, right? If I plug that into that, I get the function square root of X cubed plus five X minus one. And that's what we're doing. We'll break it up into those two parts. When if I did that, I can, if I'm doing the limit of that, well, I can just do the limit of this part, right? I can do the limit of that part. And so if I do the limit of that part, I could just do a direct substitution um, because that is a polynomial. So I can plug that into there. Um, and then I get five. So this is gonna be F, this is equal to five. So I get F of five. But remember that F of X is equal to square, uh, square root of X. So then that means f of five is equal to the square root of five, okay? Now, do you have to break it up into these two portions and then do the limit of the inside and then to get the, the total thing? No, uh, this is just showing you the theorem, right? So normally we could just plug it in and do a direct substitution. So without for part B, if, I don't, if I'm not concerned with using those theorems or anything like that, I could just do a direct substitution. I can plug this into here and by doing so gives me, you know, I get the cube root of the limit, right? I plug, I start plugging in that limit into there. And then I get, I do the inside because X is now two. And then I get 27 and then the cube root 27 is three. Okay. So without detailing all the steps, you can just go ahead and do a direct substitution. Again, I'm just showing you that it works, right? If you use the theorems. 
All right, so let's look at the um, next theorem. Now, this we already used the two theorems, the theorem 3, 4, and 3, 5. So let's go ahead and introduce a new theorem that we're going to use. Um, and this is for trigonometric functions. So up to this point, we've done, we've done polynomials, we've done rational functions, we've done radical functions. Now we're going to look at trigonometric functions, okay? So trig functions. And remember that all these theorems basically say that the limit of these functions is equal to the function evaluated at that value right so because these functions are all continuous right so the sine uh function remember the sine function looks like this right it's a continuous function so if i'm doing a limit uh at any point right then that's just going to be the function at that point right so whatever the function at that point is i'm doing the limit there it's just whatever that value is because it's continuous all right, uh, same thing for the cosine. Um, the limit uh, as x approaches c for cosine of x, it's just cosine at c. Same thing for tan. This works for tangent as long as x, um, c, as long as uh, c is not, um, for example, so c cannot be uh, an asymptote. Because remember, tangent has asymptotes. So um, the tangent has an asymptote at pi over 2, right? Uh, etc. So that works as long as c is not equal to that. So as long as c is in the domain, right? So remember the tangent looks like this, um, where where this is pi over two and this is negative pi over two, right? And it continues on and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, tangent is continuous within its domain, right? And so that you can use it for as long as it's within you know those asymptotes. Uh, same thing for cotangent. Uh, as long as you're within the asymptotes, same thing for secant and cosecant. As long as you're within the asymptotes, um, then you should be fine to uh, plug in for x. All right, so example four, uh, find the following limits. So if I, um, because these are trigonometric functions, I can just do a direct substitution because of the previous theorem. All right, so um, this case, remember that this is composed of two different functions. So I'm going to split them into two, right? And then do it uh, using that property. Um, this is a product, right? So I can break it into a product with two limits and then I can just do a direct substitution. Do you have to break it up that way? The answer is no. You could just do a direct substitution right away and get the same exact answer. So you get zero times tan of zero, which is zero. Again, just plug it in and get that value. Um, so if I plug and do a direct substitution into cosine, the cosine function, uh, again, I put the squared on the outside, but it doesn't really matter because you're going to get the same answer regardless. But what I'm, what I did is I just did the limit first and then um, squared it using one of the previous theorems. Um, and then we know that the limit of cosine of pi is negative one. Well, we know, so again, this, there, there shouldn't be a limit here, right? I've already done that limit. So this should not be here. Sorry, that's a typo. Uh, once you once you do the direct substitution, you no longer need to include the limit symbol, right? So this is cosine of pi now. Um, and cosine of pi is negative one. And then we raise it to the second power and that gives us one. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Just do a direct substitution. Nothing crazy going on here. All right, so let's look at another theorem. So um, let C be an, a real number in the domain of the given trigonometric functions. Let f of x equal to g of x for all, this means for all, right? I think I, I might have mentioned that um, um, earlier, but if I did not, uh, I'm going to make sure I do that. So this is, this is for all, for all x that is not equal to c in an open interval containing c. If the limit of g of x as x approaches c exists, so if that limit exists, then the limit of f of x also exists and they're actually equal to each other. The two limits are equal to each other. So in other words, if I have a function f of x, which is the same thing as the function g of x, except for the fact that there's a hole at f of x and there's not a hole at g of x. So basically everything is the same except for uh, at x equals c, right? Except for that point. Um, then we can say that, well, if it's the same thing, 
uh, then we could say that the limits here exist. So we could say that the because the for the the limit of g of x as x approaches c is g of c, right? We know because there's a there's there's a point there, and that limit is is going to be the same thing as for um, so it's going to be the same thing as for f of c, even though f of c is not defined. All right, so that's basically what it's saying. Um, so here's a tip. So for this. In order to find limits, first we want to try direct substitution, right? And see if that works. If that fails, meaning f of x has a whole, then what you need to do is you need to find another function that agrees with f of x everywhere except for that whole, which is like what the diagram I drew illustrates. So find a g of x that's the exact same function except for the whole part. Um, and then find the limit of the g of x as x approaches c. And that will be the same thing as for f of x. Okay, um, so that's the idea and that's the that's the concept in general. Uh, once you direct substitute into f into g of x, and this is going to be equal to the f of x by the theorem. This should say three three point seven. All right. Uh, so so let's look at the first uh, technique here um, in order to illustrate this um, property. What we were just saying. Uh, the first technique is known as the dividing out technique. So if you direct substitute into f of x and you get something like 0 out of 0, um, this is known as indeterminate form. There's, there are several indeterminate forms that we'll look at throughout the calculus series. 0 out of 0 is one of them. Um, so there's other indeterminate forms where you, there, there's no value associated with them. They're indeterminate. Um, so if you get that, that means... Um, you need to use a dividing out technique or something like that. So first plug it in to see if you get zero out of zero. And then um, one procedure to, uh, to not get zero out of zero and get to actually get a number off of it is um, the dividing out technique. So this involves factoring and dividing out the common factors. Uh, sometimes you might have a complex fraction that you'll have to simplify. Um, and then you'll end up canceling out a common factor. So the dividing out technique is a technique that divides out or cancels out common factors, uh, if possible. So if that is possible, then you can use a dividing out technique. So here's an example. If I look at this limit and I do a direct substitution into it, so I, I, I start plugging it in. Okay, so yeah, this, I mean, this is, I can technically, I should be able to do a direct substitution, right? But if I do that, Notice that I get zero on the numerator and zero on the denominator. Well, first off, we know we cannot get zero on the denominator, but we also have zero in the numerator. So this is an indeterminate form, right? And so what we need to do is, say, okay, so f of x is equal to this function, which has a whole or whatever, because obviously it doesn't exist at that, at that point. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use a dividing out technique. We're going to factor this. So the numerator, I can factor that. This is a difference of squares. Right, so the difference of squares. Remember, the difference of squares is if I have x squared, um, x to the uh, x squared minus, or um, here this is how this is how they write it. So in algebra, we had a squared minus b squared, but then we can always factor that into a plus b times a minus b. Okay, so that's using difference of squares. Um, so I get that for the top, and then and then I can factor this even further, right? Um, by using another difference of squares into x minus 1 times x plus 1. So I'm doing difference of squares twice. And then notice that this cancels out. And that leaves me with x plus 1 times x squared plus 1. Well, this function is looks different than that, right? We're going to call that function g of x. That function is identical except for the fact that we canceled out the 1. So g of x does not have a whole, whereas f of x does. So what we can do is we're going to do the limit of g, and that will give us the limit of f. Okay, so this is how the functions look like. So this is the this here on the right is x plus one times x squared plus one. Okay, on the left is the original function x to the fourth minus one over x minus one. So notice they're the exact same function except for f of x has a hole there at at one which makes sense because if I plug in one, I get the indeterminate form. So I get a hole there, but for G, I do not get a hole. I get a value of four, 
right, at uh, x equals 1. So I can do the limit of g, and then I can get the answer for f, so that we know that the limit is going to be 4. Um, so we can just do the limit of the g portion, right? So the, um, basically do a direct substitution to here, OK? If I do a direct substitution, that gives me 1 plus 1 times 1 squared plus 1, which is 2 times 2, which is 4. And that's the limit. So then the limit has to be uh, 4. All right, so um, let's look at another example. So again, if I do a direct substitution into here, uh, I get uh, 0 out of 0. Make sure you verify that for yourself. But you get 0 out of 0, so that's indeterminate. Uh, so we're going to um, say that we're going to basically factor the top and using dividing out technique. So this is called the dividing out technique, right? Where we divide that out, cancel that out. And so this turns into just x plus 1 as the function, and we're taking the limit of that as x squared is 5. Uh, this is continuous, so we can do a direct substitution and get a solution, right? Uh, so 5 plus 1 is 6, and so that means, let me go back, that means that the limit of this is equal to 6. So remember, the limit exists, but the function at that point does not exist, right, for the original. So just something to keep in mind. All right, so let's look at another one. So uh, the limit of this complex fraction, this is a complex fraction. It's a fraction within a fraction, right? So there's a fraction on the numerator or and or the denominator. So it's a complex fraction. When you see a complex fraction, well, first off, let's do a direct substitution to see if we don't we even have to use a dividing out technique. Um, so if I plug it in, I get zero out of zero in the terminate form. So that means we're going to need to use a dividing out technique or some other technique. But here we only have dividing out technique that we've taught you, that we've shown. So let's see if we can use it. So we have a complex fraction. So let's see if we have a so if I if I do the uh, the first part, one over x plus one minus one fourth, right? If I do that, I need a common denominator. So if I need a common denominator, basically to get a common denominator, I multiply these two together. So uh, if I multiply those two together, well, this can be four times that, right? And if I multiply this by four, then I have to multiply the top by four. If I multiply the, f um, and this has to be four times x plus one. These have to be multiplied together to get the same common denominator. Uh, so if I multiply this by x plus one, then I have to multiply the top by x plus 1. And that's how I got this portion right here. So I got 4 minus, and then I got x plus 1. So that's how I got this that portion right there, 4 minus x plus 1. And then over a common denominator. So now we can just put them over a common denominator. OK, so I'm not going to go over that in too much detail. Um, you know, it's just a little bit of algebra, so um, which is a prerequisite to the course. Um, but yeah, just practice that and uh, you should be okay. Um, all right, so then we have this. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, I, I didn't really do much in that problem. I think there's... Um, I think that it's... I don't know if it's skipped a step or something like that, but don't worry too much about this. This is the same exact thing. Um, so I'm not sure why that step is there. But so what we're going to do is for... Uh, I guess what I should have done here is say, okay, well, I, I need to distribute this, right? I need to distribute the negative. So then if I do that, the, the, the parentheses go away, and it's going to be negative x minus 1, okay? So that's what that step should have shown. And then 4 minus x, or 4 minus 1 is 3. So that's how I got the 3 here. And then we got negative x. So that's how we get to the next step. All right, and then we can say that this is the same as this. If I pull out the negative, I'm going to pull out the negative, and if I do so, so essentially if I put this in parentheses, that's going to change this into a negative because if I distribute it, it gives me the same thing. Okay, so that gives me this. So again, if I distribute this, I get uh, the original here. Okay. Uh, and I do that because notice that these x minus 3s will cancel, the, the top one here and the bottom one. That's why I do that. So, um, and then I can bring this down to the bottom. If I do that, I get one fraction. Instead of having a complex fraction, I have just one fraction. Um, then if I do that, then I notice that these cancel out. And if I do, and if they cancel out, that gives me, this becomes negative 1 because there's a negative there. 
um, over, I just have the bottom here left over. Then I can do a direct substitution. And then uh, if I do a direct substitution, it gives me negative 1 16th. All right, so let's look at the, um, <clears throat> so let's look at um, another technique, uh, the rationalizing technique. So uh, sometimes you won't have, you won't be able to divide out. And so, well, um, sometimes you'll have um, radical functions. And so you'll need to do something known as rationalizing. Um, and so that's what this technique is about. Now for the rationalizing technique, um, it, does, it may also involve dividing out where you rationalize first and then you divide out. So um, whenever you have a radical in the numerator or denominator, sometimes you wanna get rid of it and we call that rationalizing. So to do this, we have to multiply the numerator or, or and the denominator by the conjugate. So for example, in this um, you know, fraction here, on the denominator, we have a square root. Um, and in order to get rid of that, we need to multiply by the conjugate. The conjugate of the denominator, which is square root, square root of x minus 1, is the square root of x and then plus 1. So the conjugate. And then whatever we do to the bottom, we do to the top. So this is the rationalization or rationalizing process. So if we um, look at the next example, we have uh, radicals in the numerator. And so we need to get rid of um, them. Um, and for, first off, why do we need to get rid of them? Well, first off, you notice that if we um, do a direct substitution, if we plug um, x equals 4 in to there and there, well, you notice that we get 0 out of 0. And so that tells us that we need to do some kind of rationaliza uh, rationalizing because there's a radical. Um, and we'll see if that works. And if it, you know, if it doesn't work, then you know, we look at other techniques, right? But usually this sort of thing uh, lets you know that you need to do this method. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit, the, the original function. We're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the numerator because the numerator has the radical. Remember, the conjugate is the same is the same expression as the original, except the signs are opposite, right? The signs, uh, the operations in the middle are opposite uh, in nature. So we got one negative, one positive. And so by doing that, we can, uh, when we multiply these two together, right? When we multiply the two, the numerator and denominator, it becomes, so I'll, I'll write down what it becomes. You get, uh, if we FOIL it, uh, we end up getting this number squared minus this number squared, which gives us that numerator. Okay, so if you try if you foil that, you're going to get that expression um, there. And then, of course, on the denominator, we're just kind of multiplying them. We're just kind of putting them together on the denominator. And so when we do that, we can combine the two and the negative six, of course, and get negative four. And notice that these cancel out, leaving me with 1 in the numerator. So I end up with the limit uh, of 1 over and then that denominator. And then we can go ahead and do a direct substitution. So we can plug that in there. Um, and so by doing that, we get 1 over 2 square root of 6. And um, of course, usually in, um, in mathematics, we don't like to have the radical in the denominator, right? Um, so you could leave your answer as 1 over 2 square root of 6, but sometimes we like to rationalize that. Um, so we would multiply by square root of 6, top and bottom, because we usually don't like denominators to have radicals. Um, so if you want, you could um, you can multiply by the square root of 6, top and bottom, and that will rationalize or get rid of it. So square root of 6 times square root of 6 is 6, and then 6 times 2 is 12. Okay. Um, so either one of these is correct, so it's so it's going to be this or this are both correct answers. All right, so we looked at a rationalization, uh, rationalizing technique. So let's look at another theorem. So this is the squeeze theorem. The squeeze theorem is one of those theorems that uh, is useful um, in certain applications, but in, you know, in practice, it can be kind of difficult to actually implement, right? Because what it does is, let's say you have three functions, f of x, g of x, and h of x, and one of the functions, f of x, is, is between 
h of x and g of x, right? So the value is between it. In other words, f of x is squeezed between h of x and g of x, right? So if we have, for example, let's say this is h of x. Uh, let me see if I can draw it better. So let's say this is h of x. I'm going to do these capital, but they don't have to be capital function, you know, capital H, but I'm just going to do capital. And then let's say this here is f of x. And then this here is, you know, g of x. So notice that everywhere in the domain of the function, f is between h and g, right? Um, and so f is squeezed between h and g, sort of like a sandwich, right? Um, so if it's if it's like that for every x in, in an open interval that contains the value c, in this case the value c could be this value here where x is equal to c, for example. Um, and then if we know that the limit of the h as x approaches c is some value l, right? And the same thing with g, if you do the same thing with g, you do the, uh, uh, the limit as x approaches c and you get the same value l, in other words, this point right here, then that means that the limit of the function f must be l as well. And that's the squeeze theorem. And that makes sense if you look at the diagram, okay? But in practice, trying to find the function h and g where f is always between it can be kind of difficult. And so we're gonna look at some examples of this. Um, however, um, these are optional. So if you want to skip these examples, you can. These, these are a little bit more, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit more involved as far as using the squeeze theorem. So if you want to skip this, um, I, I provide an asterisk there so that you know that it's optional, you know, as far as, you know, like you could skip it and not really um, lose all that much. But if you want to, you know, do something a little rigorous and a little bit more advanced, then stay tuned. So uh, for 7a, find the limit using the squeeze theorem. So we're going to use a theorem um, that says that this is equal to an actual value, but we're going to prove what that is using, using the squeeze theorem. Okay, so let's figure out what it is. Well, first off, what we need to do is we're going we're gonna to try doing a direct substitution first. And you notice that if I plug in 0 into that, sine of 0 is 0. And obviously, if you plug in 0 into x, that's 0 as well. So we got a... We got a a zero out of zero so we got an indeterminate form and so what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to suppose that x is a positive number so we're not going to consider negative numbers although this, is, this argument would work for negative numbers as well but we're just going to focus on the positive numbers and um let's say uh, the x is an, is an angle because we're dealing with sine and sine has angles right sine of 30 degrees or so but this is going to be in radians so x is going to be in radians okay so we're going to introduce the unit circle here. That's a circle of radius one, right? With the center at the origin. And we're going to use this diagram to, in order to implement the squeeze theorem. So first off, what we're going to do is um, we're going to be working only with the first quadrant because we're dealing with positive ang um, angles, okay? Um, and we're just focusing on the first quadrant. So if I focus on the first quadrant, if I put a point on the, the, on the unit circle, any point on the unit circle can be expressed in terms of cosine and sine, right? So if you if you remember from trigonometry, any point on the unit circle, the x value is the cosine of the angle, and then the y value is the sine of the angle, okay? Remember that x is angle, so x is equal to the angle in radians. So, um, so this is an angle. So that x that you see there, that's an angle, okay? And so the and not to confuse the x coordinate with the x as the angle because that could be a little confusing right this is an angle and then the quote unquote x coordinate right the quote unquote x coordinate of a traditional coordinate system is cosine of x okay so i don't want you to confuse that part right there okay so we're going to draw a line that blue line from the coordinate which is given by cosine x and sine x to of the end of the unit circle at one and we notice that the that forms a triangle and notice that the height of that triangle is given by sine of x and the reason is if you want a, a, a refresher on that is this is a right triangle and this is the angle x right and remember that this 
um, this is uh, the radius of the circle, which is one, right? So remember, this is one because that's the radius of the circle. And so if I wanted to get this uh, right here, let's call that Y, uh, let's call that, um, let's call, let's just call it A. So if I want to get the value A, well, remember I had to do, use some, um, some trigonometry. So if I use sine, sine of X is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So it's equal to A over one, which is just A. In other words, that value is sine of X. Okay. So that height is sine of X essentially. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, you know, because this is based on some basic trig there. So the height is sine x. And then, um, so then the area of that triangle is equal to, remember the area of a triangle is one half base times height. And so the base here is one, right? So the base is one. And the height is that, which is sine of x, right? So one half base times height. So that gives us one half times one times sine x, which is sine x over two. All right, so we got the area of that triangle. We're going to tuck that off to the side for now because we're going to use it later. For now, let's go ahead and look at something else. Let's look at this red arc here. Um, so that red arc, what's the length? What's the area of that, of this? Um, this is not area of the arc, sorry. This is the area of the sector. I should say the area of the sector, not arc. Um, the, so what is the area of this sector is what I'm trying to ask. So the area of a, of a sector is equal to one half um, times the angle. So one half times, let me just write it down, one half times radius squared times angle. So um, that's the area of a sector, is one half times the radius squared times the angle. Well, in this case, the radius is one, right? The radius here is one. So it's just one squared. And then the angle we said is x, right? So that's that's our area of our sector, it's x over two. Okay, so we got the area of the sector, we got the area of the triangle. We're gonna look at the area of this triangle right here. Um, so notice this is what it was before. And then we're going to lengthen that and we're gonna do a triangle where the, the length of the side of the triangle is one, okay? And then we're gonna project that up and then uh, and then connect that from the center. And this, this line obviously goes through this point, cosine x, sine x. Well, this coordinate right here is, uh, this, is this, this, this height right here is tangent of x. Um, and the reason is that this is a right triangle, right? So if that's a right triangle, um, and I, if I just focus on this right triangle right here, where this is one, and I'm trying to figure out, let's just call this uh, A, because we didn't, we want to figure out what it is. And this is the angle X, right? So if I, if I were to use tangent, right? So tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. And so adjacent is one, so this is going to be A. And so that's telling me that this is tangent. Okay, so that's why that's tangent. Okay, so now we know that that side has that triangle has sides one and tangent x. All right, so let me um, let me erase this stuff here. Okay, so then the area of that purple triangle in that case is one half times base times height. The height is tan, and then the base is one, so it's tan x, tan x over two. Okay, so we're going to put those three together. We have the blue the triangle formed by that blue segment, the arc, the sector formed by that red arc, and then we have the triangle formed by the purple, the purple triangle. So notice that the red is squeezed between the blue and the purple. That's the squeeze theorem that we're gonna to try to use here, okay? So we notice that the red, the area of the sector is squeezed between the area of the blue triangle and the area of the purple triangle. This is what I mean about it's sometimes difficult to find the right functions where it's always between them, but we can see that it's always between them in this case. All right, so in that case, the area, this is the area of the sector. Remember, this is the sector. This is the, this is triangle, the blue triangle, and then this is triangle two, right? This is the sector. Um, so it's between those two. All right, and in that case, we know what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna flip this into the reciprocal of uh, of all the sides. 
uh, so that we can have x on the bottom. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by sine x over 2. That way uh, these twos cancel, uh, these signs cancel, and then these twos cancel, leaving us with 1. Um, and then these twos cancel. And so what we um, so we, we end up with is cosine uh, cosine on the left side because this is sine over tangent. So let's show you how we do that. This is sine over tangent, and tangent is sine over cosine. So we got tangent itself is equal to sine over cosine. That's an identity. Um, and then we notice that the sines cancel out, and then cosine goes flips back up to the top. Uh, so we have cosine. And then here we got sine x over x, so that works out in the middle. And then we got 1 on the right, so it cleans up very nicely. And now we're going to take this here, and we're going to take the limit as x approaches 0 of all three portions of this inequality. And then we can employ the uh, squeeze theorem. Because the limit here, if I do a direct substitution, cosine of 0 is 1. The limit uh, here of 1 is just 1. So we have that there's one on each side. So that means the limit is squeezed between those two um, ones. And therefore, this limit by the squeeze theorem must be equal to one. And therefore, it's equal to one. OK, so there's, a, uh, there's an example of the squeeze theorem. We're going to show you another example of the squeeze theorem. Uh, so this is also optional. There's the asterisk there. So if you um, don't want to necessarily do something you know that advanced, you can skip through this and, and you'll be just fine. Uh, find the limit using the squeeze theorem. All right, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to do a direct substitution. And when we do that, we notice that we get 0 out of 0. So that's indeterminate form. Therefore, we're going to need to use some kind of method. If you can't find a method, we're going to, in this case, we're going to use the squeeze theorem. So again, supposing that x is a positive number and an acute angle in radians, and we do that so that we could just focus on the positive numbers and not deal with negatives, but it works for negatives as well. We'll be working on the first quadrant. So we know that on the unit circle, uh, let's call this coordinate x comma y. Um, well, I, I guess I should call it um, cosine x sine of x, right? So let me see. Let me just call this so we don't confuse it. Well, we'll leave it like that for now and go for there. We know that this is quote unquote x, which is not the same as that x, right? Uh, so I want you to keep that in mind that these, this x is an angle and this x is a coordinate. So I'm going to put that in quotations just so that you're aware that that's x the coordinate and that's y the coordinate. But this is traditionally cosine x and sine y or sine x, sorry. Okay, so we're gonna we're just gonna use that it's cosine x and sine x. All right, so we're gonna you we're gonna draw again. Um, these are I'm gonna put these in quotes just so that you know that it's not the angle x uh, necessarily for that. It's just a coordinate. Um, so here we have this purple triangle um, that we're, we've drawn. And if we uh, were to find the height of this triangle, the height, or um, so here, let's go back to the original drawing. So we have this, we're gonna draw this purple triangle. And then we know that this, this distance is one right here. And if that distance is one, that means the, that this distance here, um, and let's see if I can zoom back out or zoom back um, out here sorry uh, okay so zoom back out there I didn't mean to zoom in that that hard that um, you know that much there that means that this right here has to be 1 minus cosine X because remember that this here this is cosine of X uh, and remember, let me just erase this and just so just to avoid that, I'm, I'm going to cross this out just to avoid that confusion. Cosine x, sine x. So that x coordinate, that quote unquote x coordinate, right, is cosine of x. And so that means that the other side has to be 1 minus cosine x. Again, crossing this out. I'm going to cross these out every time I see it just so that, you know, we can avoid that confusion there. Um, all right. So that so we know that this this bottom side is 1 minus cosine x. Uh, and then if we look at this arc, this arc right here, uh, this red arc is x because um, if we look at the um, the the arc length, the formula for arc length is radius times angle. The formula of arc length is radius times angle, and the radius is one. 
and the angle here is x, and so therefore this has to be x. So 1 times x is x. So that means that this red arc is just x. Okay, now notice that this purple line is shorter than the red arc, but it's longer than this 1 minus cosine uh, x line. And this is always going to be true because this is a right triangle and this purple is always going to be longer than 1 minus cosine x because the the purple is the hypotenuse and the hypotenuse is always longer than its two sides so we know that this purple is always greater than this cos 1 minus cosine x and it's always going to be smaller than this red arc because you can see geometrically so um and then the length of that so we know by the pythagorean theorem you got a squared plus uh, b squared equals c squared, right? And we know that this is 1 minus cosine. And this is equal to uh, sine. Remember that the height of this is sine x, right? And again, I'm going to cross this out just to avoid that confusion. <clears throat> so this is sine of x. All right. Um, so if I were to do the this right triangle, just replacing those numbers, let's call this C, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You can see I got A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So that's how I get this expression right here, right? And of course, you know, I have to take the square root. So that's why I took the square root. Okay, so that purple part is square root of sine x squared plus one minus cosine x squared. All right, so let me erase that. Um, so notice that this, the one minus cosine is the shortest, the purple side is the longest, and then the or is the second longest, and then the red arc is the the longest of the three. So therefore, by the squeeze theorem, we can say we can confidently say that this per this is the purple. This is uh, the short side, and then this x is the arc. So we can confidently say that the purple is between the, the, the short side and then the, the red arc. Uh, and therefore, what we can do is we're going to square uh, all, we're going to square everything on here. Um, and so that'll cancel out the square root in the middle. And then we're going to, um, we're going to basically uh, foil this and combine that with the sine x squared. So if I foil one minus cosine x squared, that gives me, if I foil that, I get one minus two cosine plus cosine squared, if I FOIL that. Um, but then if I add that to sine x squared, or sine squared, then I add that here. Well, then remember that this is equal to one. Cosine squared plus sine squared is always equal to one. That's a trig identity. And then one plus one gives me two. So that's how I got two right here, okay? Um, and then if I continue that, I can divide um, everything by two, and that will basically turn these into one, right? Cancel that out, and that gives me in the middle. And then um, notice that this is always going to be greater than zero, because this is a positive number. This number is always positive right? Or it could be zero, right? It could be positive or zero. Um, and so it's greater than or equal to zero. So we're going to say that, that one minus cosine is between zero and x squared over two. And that looks a lot, that looks a lot simpler. And then what we can do is we can, um, we can divide by x on all three sides here. And zero divided by x is zero. We got one minus cosine over x, and we get one of these cancels out, right, with this, uh, so x over two. And this is the inequality that we want. And then we can take the limit as x approaches zero. Uh, this is gonna turn into zero, and this is gonna turn into zero, because zero divided by two is zero. And so this is squeezed between those two zeros, and therefore the limit must equal to zero. And that is the end uh, of that proof for that limit. Okay, but like I said, you could skip this and you, and you won't really lose anything. This is just more advanced uh, because we're going to introduce this theorem 2.9 and theorem 2.9 basically uses the same limits that we just said, that we proved, um, that 
this limit is equal to one, this limit is equal to zero. Okay, and we proved that in the previous two examples. All right, so in, in examples that use the, that theorem, you're just basically applying the, the property, right? So uh, in this case, we got the limit of sine of 4x over x is uh, as x approaches zero. What is that equal to? This is almost equal to where it's sine x over x, right? It's almost equal to that, but there's a four there, so that's kind of messing things up a little bit. Let's do a direct substitution first. If I do a direct substitution, I get zero out of zero. So, you know, we have to do something about that. So we're gonna use the property. We need to be able to match this up with sine x over x. So what we're gonna do is, because these have to be the same, well then if this is a 4x, then this has to be a 4x as well, right? We need to introduce a four there. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna put a four there, but if we put a four there, we need to put a four out here because that way four divided by four cancels out and that gives us the original, okay? So essentially what I'm doing is I have this function and I need to introduce a four, but if I introduce a four on the bottom, I must introduce a four on the top so that it balances out. And then I just pull that four out of the limit. So that's why I did that, okay? Um, and then that four now is now outside the limit. And now this notice matches up. See, if I replace that with u, it looks exactly like what we want it to be, where it's the same thing on the top and bottom, sign u over u. And therefore, this here is equal to um, one, right? So we got four times one is four. In the end, the limit is four. All right, that is it for the theorems and properties. Pretty long lesson, very involved with um, you know, solving uh, limits analytically. Here are some review problems. If you wanna write them down and pause the video and try them before we go over them, please feel free to do so. We're gonna go over each of these uh, in detail. Okay, so um, hopefully you paused the video, maybe wrote down the problems, maybe gave them an attempt. Um, so we're gonna go through each of those uh, one by one. So let's take a look at the first one, um, the limit of that function as x approaches four. So again, if you plug in, so we're gonna first try plugging in, when you see a limit, first try to doing a direct substitution. By any of the theorems you know that we discussed before, we can do a direct substitution and see if it works. So, um, so let's plug that into here and here and see what we get. We got 12 times square root four minus three over four minus nine. And here, it looks like it works out nicely. The square root of four is two, so we got two minus three. And then we got four minus nine is negative five. And then uh, two minus three is negative one. So this is gonna be negative 12 over negative five, which is 12 fifths. All right, so you can leave it like that or you can convert it to a decimal, doesn't really matter. Fractions are usually the way to go for the most part. All right, so let's take a look at the next one. So now the same problem, but this time we're evaluating the limit as x approaches nine. So we're, we're finding the limit as x approaches nine. So again, try a direct substitution, but you already know, hopefully, that if you plug this in, you're gonna get zero out of zero. So, but we're gonna show you anyways, see what we get. So we get, this is three, and then three minus three is gonna turn into zero. So we get zero over zero. So we got an indeterminate, we got an indeterminate form. So because we see a radical there, that means we're going to rationalize. So we're gonna to try to rationalize the square root of x minus three. The conjugate of that is square root of x plus three, okay? So if you want, you can kind of uh, pull the 12 off to the side because that's a property. You can pull constants off to the side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the 12 off to the side and just focus on the main portion of the limit. Um, so we got square root of x minus three over x minus nine. We're gonna multiply that by the conjugate, which is the same thing as the numerator here because that's the one that's the radical. Same expression as the, the one with the radical, but change that minus to a plus. So we're gonna, I'm just gonna put parentheses around these, and multiply this by square root of x plus three, right? So you just change the minus to a plus. That's what makes it a conjugate. And whatever you do on the bottom, you do on the top as well, vice versa. 
All right, so we're going to foil the top part, and we're not going to foil the bottom part. We're just going to foil the top part because that's the part that we want to get rid of the radical. Um, so if I foil that, that turns into x minus 9, okay? And, I, and you can verify that if you will. I'm not going to go over in detail of that. Just do the foil, and you're going to get x minus 9. You can use a difference of squares to help you with that. Um, so we got x minus 9, that cancels, that leaves you with a 1 on the numerator. So we get 1 over square root of x plus 3. And then you can plug that 9 into the denominator. So doing so will give you 1 over square root of 9 plus 3. And square root of 9 is 3, so we got 1 over 3 plus 3, so we got 1 over 6. All right, so one six is the uh, is the limit that we have. However, it's not the complete limit because remember we forgot to include the twelve. I forgot to include the twelve that I pulled off to the side, right? So let's go ahead and start multiplying that in. So we got twelve times one is twelve. Okay, so we got to multiply that back in because we can't forget about the twelve. All right, so it's actually twelve over six, which is two. All right, so the limit is two. Okay, so uh, so don't make that mistake that I made. I almost made. Um, go ahead and uh, fix that. All right, so for part C, um, we're going to um, do the limit as x approaches 4. Again, try doing a direct substitution first before, and see before you uh, see if you encounter any issues. Okay, so if I do that, I get 4 squared plus 4 minus 6 over 4 squared minus 9. So we get 16 plus 4 minus 6. That's 20 minus 6 is 14. Um, yep, so we get 14, and this is 16 minus 9, which is 7. So 14 divided by 7 is 2. So the limit is 2. That's it. Pretty straightforward. All right, so the next one. The limit as x approaches 3 of that function. Uh, so let's try to do a direct substitution, but we know that it's probably going to be the ones that don't work but we want to verify. So we get nine plus three minus six over nine minus nine, which um, uh, oops. Uh, so just want to make sure, uh, make you aware this should be a negative three, not a positive three. Uh, so in your exercise, if I don't remember, if it says positive 3, it should say negative 3. So I apologize for that. Um, so it should be negative 3 squared plus negative 3. So we can change this to a minus. So that's what it should say, uh, negative 3 squared. Okay. In that case, we got negative 3 squared. It says 9, 9 minus 3 minus 6 is 0. And then 9 minus 9 is 0. So that gives you the indeterminate form. Uh, if you had positive 3, that wouldn't give you the indeterminate form. And then in fact, that would be a limit that we would use. We would actually do that in a future lesson. But if you have 0 out of 0, this is what we're looking for. So we have the indeterminate form. Um, so therefore, we're going to see if we can use the dividing out technique. So we're going to factor this um, top part right here. Um, I like to use a x table for that. So we need to find factors of negative 6 that add up to this middle coefficient of 1, positive 1. So the two numbers that multiply to negative 6 but add up to 1 are 3 and negative 2. They multiply to the top but add to the bottom. And therefore I can factor that top part as x plus 3 and x minus 2. Um, so I get the limit as x approaches 3 of the numerator is x plus 3 times x minus 2. Now the, the, the bottom part, that's a difference of squares. So that factors out as x plus 3, x minus 3. So again, practice your difference of squares. You know, I review that if you need to. Um, but notice that these terms cancel out. Uh, so we're left with uh, something that we can do a direct substitution. So we can do it to there and to there. So in, that, in, in other words, we have 3 minus 2 over... Uh, sorry, negative 3. I keep putting... I keep saying positive 3. Negative 3 minus 2 over negative 3 minus 3. 
So negative three minus two is negative five, and then we got negative six on the bottom. So this turns into five over six. All right, takes care of D. So let's look at E. So we got limit as x approaches negative two. I remembered to put a negative there. Let's see if that's the right one. Let's plug, let's plug that in to see if we get um, an indeterminate form. So clearly on the bottom we get zero. On the top we got, this is four, so four times three is 12. We get five times negative two, so that's negative 10. And then if we, if we do that, we do get zero out of zero. So we do, we do get the indeterminate form. Um, so that means that we can proceed with factoring dividing out technique. So uh, in order to factor this right here, we need to basically multiply these two terms, which is negative six. So we're gonna set up an X table, but this time, instead of doing negative two, we're gonna do three times negative two and the negative six. This is the, called the AC method is what I call it. I call I multiply the A and the C together. Um, you can factor this however way you want. You can you can do um, you can um, do um, process elimination or the guessing guess and check way, however way you want to do it. I like to use the AC method to to do it. But yeah, multiply three and negative two to so get negative six, and they had to add to this middle coefficient of five. So we need two numbers that make this work. Um, and that's going to be um, negative uh, five and sorry. Um, positive six and negative one. Six times negative one is negative six, but if I add those, I get five. All right, so we're gonna focus on factoring this top portion. I'm, I'm only gonna focus on the numerator for now, and then we'll go ahead and do the, we'll put it back into the limit later. So I'm gonna write this out as three x squared plus six x minus x minus two, and that's using these two terms here, plus six, minus one, right? Then I'm going to uh, factor by grouping, so I'm going to group these terms together. Remember, if I group these terms together, this has to turn into a positive, so that when I distribute, it gives me the original. Um, and then I'm going to fact, I'm going to pull out a three and an x from the first group, giving me x plus two. I'm going to pull, I'm going to basically just, this is an invisible one here and I have x plus two here. So these two terms match so that I can say that, I can confidently say that I have three x minus one as my factor and x plus two as my other factor. So that's uh, AC method of factoring. So we know what that top part goes to. All right, so we're gonna write down that limit again. So this limit right here is equal to the limit as x approaches negative two of three x minus one times x plus two over x plus two. Notice that the x plus twos cancel, leaving me with the three x minus one. We can plug this into here by direct substitution, uh, and we get negative six minus one is negative seven. All right, so there's the dividing out technique. We had a few examples of that. This one is a dividing up uh, technique, but using complex fractions, right? So there's a fraction on the top, or it's fractions on the top within a fraction. So um, in order to do this, you need to come, you need to find the like terms. Well, first off, let's plug it in and see if it actually works. So if I plug it in, I get one over zero plus four minus one fourth over zero. So we got one fourth minus one fourth is zero. So yeah, we do get the indeterminate form. Unfortunately, that means we have to do some more, more work. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine these two uh, fractions here we need to have a common denominator. So let me rewrite this um, here. I'm gonna rewrite it um, slightly larger so we can kind of see what's going on. So we need these to have a common denominator. So I'm gonna multiply this by x plus four uh, because that has an x plus four. And I'm gonna multiply this by four. And that way they have the same denominator. But if I multiply this by x plus four, I have to do it on the top as well. If I multiply this by four, I have to do it on the top as well for that, okay? Um, and that's how we can get a com you know, common denominator for those fractions. So we get the limit as x approaches zero of this complex fraction, 
you get four over, now this is over x plus four times x plus four, so I'm going to put this under a common denominator of four times x plus four, because we know that the denominators are the same now, so we can just group them. So we have four minus x plus four. That's what this part was, x plus four. Um, okay, so now we're going to do, we're and then this is all over x. All right, so we got the limit as x approaches zero. Um, so if I do this uh, part right here, I can distribute that, and that gives me a negative, and then we know that four minus four is zero. So that gives me negative x on the top. over that denominator over x. Now we can bring this denominator down because when you multiply two fractions uh, or when you divide two fractions together, you're essentially converting it into a multiplication problem. So we're converting this into, we have to flip uh, the second fraction, right? Um, we have to flip, flip the second fraction and then multiply. So when we do that, we get We get this, so we flip this fraction to so it becomes one over x, right? And then we can multiply, and so it, the one over x goes on the bottom. All right. Uh, practice your fractions if you're you know having trouble with that. Just practice dividing two fractions together or two number, you know, like that. But notice that these cancel. This x cancels, leaving me with negative one. So this is an invisible one here. So this is negative one. Um, so now we can go ahead and plug in this zero and do a direct substitution. So we have negative 1 over 4 times 0 plus 4. We get negative 1 over 4 times 4, which is 16. So we get negative 1 16th. All right, those complex fractions can be, well, complex, but they're not too bad. If you, It takes a little practice, but it's not too bad. All right, so... Um, Let's look at the next one. We have two, we have functions f and g, and we want to find the limit of a composition. So this is uh, g of f of x. So this is g circle f, right? G compose f, same thing. Um, so yeah, we're going to plug in f into g uh, and then do the limit. But remember that one of the theorems says that if I do this, I can do the limit, or I can do g of and then I can do the limit of the inside, right? So that's one of the theorems for the composition. So I could just do the limit of f of x as x approaches zero. So let's do that. Um, so if I do the limit, let's just do that off to the side. The limit, of, well, f of x is four minus x squared, right? So we can do a direct substitution since this is a polynomial. Uh, we get four minus zero squared, we get just four. So this limit is actually four. So we have g of 4. But we know g is square root of x plus 1, so I could just plug in 4 into x. So we get square root of 4 plus 1, which is 5. So we get square root of 5. All right, and that takes care of that problem. So let's look at a trigonometric um, function. Be um, trigonometric functions, remember, are continuous within their domain, right? There's, of course, asymptotes and stuff like that for some of them, but within their domain, um, they're continuous. So we can we can do a direct substitution as long as it's the, um, the number that we're substituting is not an asymptote or something like that, right? Um, so if I do that, I get secant of seven pi over x, over six, sorry. We just plug in seven into x, so secant of seven pi uh, over six. All right, and notice that, and notice that this is, um, this is in the third quadrant, seven pi over six. Um, so um, co uh, secant is negative on that, on that quadrant. This is, of course, going back to trig, basic trig. Right, so you can plug it into the calculator and get a number, or you can just remember your trig. Uh, but the reference angle is pi over six. So uh, we know it's gonna be negative. We know secant is one over cosine, right, as well. But, but the reference angle is, is pi over six, and we know it's gonna be negative because it's in quadrant three. So we got, this is the same thing as negative cosine of pi over six. Uh, and then cosine of pi over six, if you know, remember your unit circle, is uh, root three over two, 
So this is one over negative roots three over two. Uh, so if I flip it, that becomes negative two over root three. Uh, and then of course, if I rationalize, because we don't like the denominator to be radicals, right? To have a radical, so just multiply top and bottom by the radical, becomes negative two radical three over three, okay? All right, so, I'm using, and of course you can plug this into the calculator and get the same answer, you know, get an answer, it's fine. Um, but usually we like to have the exact answer, so that's why I used, you know, the unit circle. All right, so uh, this one is um, one of those properties, one of the, the newest properties, that the latest ones that we did, uh, which is, you know, the sine, um, the sine x over x, that property, right? So uh, the one that we used with squeeze theorem. So, um, but it doesn't look like it, but we're going to convert it so it looks like it. Uh, but first, let's do a direct substitution and plug it into uh, the function. So we get sine of 2 times 0 over sine of 3 times 0. But that's just sine of 0 over 0, which is 0 over 0. So we get indeterminate form. Um, so that means we're going to use the property. We're going to use this property right here, the limit as um, x oops, sorry, x approaches um, zero of sine x over x. So we're gonna use that property and the, the fact that that's equal to one. So that's one of the, the theorems, right? The one that we um, proved by the squeeze theorem. Um, so we can also think of it as limit as u approaches zero of sine of u over u. The reason why I write in terms of u is because that way, because we know that we obviously don't have just x by itself. So we just want these two to match up. If they match up, then we can use this identity, all right, or this uh, property, this theorem. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to rewrite the function here. Um, give, giving myself some room here. I'm going to separate them like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically write this, put this over 2x. That way those those two terms match up, the, the 2x and the 2x. And that gives us this term that matches up, sine of u over u. And then I'm going to put this over 3x. That way those two terms match up, the 3x and the 3x. And then they, they follow this um, theorem. But remember, we can't just include a 2x and not balance it out, right? We have to balance it out. So if I include a 2x on the bottom here, I must include a 2x on the top. Or if I include a 2x on the top there, on the bottom, I must include a 2x here, right? On the top. Uh, similarly, if I include a 3x on the bottom for this denominator, I must include a 3x here, okay? And that, of course, balances things out. Uh, but notice that these x's cancel out. So these x's cancel out right there. Um, so that leaves me with two-thirds, right? We have two over three. This is a fraction. Two, this two-thirds we can pull out. So we're going to pull that fraction out. Okay, so we have two-thirds times the limit as x approaches zero of sine of 2x over 2x over sine of 3x over 3x. But we know using this property here that this should be equal to one. We can break this up into two separate limits and say, okay, well, this is, I have the two thirds on the outside. I can do the limit of the top portion because the quote, the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits and just split it up into two limits like this, right? That's one of the properties that we discussed in the beginning. And so now we can say, oh, this is just one and this is just one according to this um, theorem right here. And so it just leaves me with two thirds. So I got two thirds as my limit. Okay. So hopefully that, that uh, made sense. Okay. So uh, let's look at the next one. Um, all right. So again, let's do a direct substitution. See what's going on here. So we have here sine of zero times one minus cosine of zero over two times zero. So clearly the sine of zero is zero and then two times zero is zero. So this is gonna give us zero over zero for sure. So this is an indeterminate form. So um, that means we're gonna to need to, we're gonna use the properties of the, you know, the, what we did last one. So we're gonna, we're gonna use 
I'm going to do it in terms of u. We're going to use the fact that this is equal to 1. And then we're going to use the fact that this 1 minus cosine of u, we're going to use u instead of x over u, is equal to 0. All right, so we're going to use these uh, facts in order to solve it. So we're going to split this, um, this, this function here into a product of two parts. So we get the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over 2x times the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull, yeah, so we can leave it like that. That's fine. We're just going to do it like that. 1 minus cosine of x. There you go. We're actually not going to use this property right here. Uh, it looks like we were going to use it, but we're actually not going to use it. Um, I thought we were, but we're not. So, so uh, if this were a squared right here, just as a side note, if that were a squared, we can split this up into 2x and then x, and then that would give us 2x squared. And then we would have to use this property right here. However, we do not need to use this property for this problem, unless that were an x squared, which it is not. Okay, so it's just using the sine property. All right, so this half, we can actually pull that out uh, as a one half, right? So we got one half limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. And then of course, uh, for this one, we're gonna do a direct substitution. So we're gonna do a direct substitution there. So we have one minus cosine of zero. All right, so we know that this is equal to one because it matches up with that property. So we got one half times one, time, and then one minus cosine zero. Cosine of zero is one, and one minus one is um, zero. So this is gonna be zero. So the answer is zero, the limit is zero. All right, guys, that is the end of the lesson. I hope you uh, found this video informative and useful. And as usual, I'll see you in the next one.